Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Oh, the uh, unofficial end of summer is upon us, and I'm a... Uh, I'm sort of limping into the home stretch. I've got this hip problem that's become, uh, I'll just say, debilitating over the past couple of days. I am hoping it just sort of goes away and I can get back to sleeping again. Um, but no one needs to hear about my health woes any more than you guys already have. So uh, you came here for the great conversation, right? And then uh, that means I'm just going to skip the long-winded intro dive right into this week's show. So my guest this time around is Jerome Charon, who has a brand new book out called Big Red, a novel starring Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles. It's published by Live Right, and it is a dynamite book. Um, Jerome has a warts and all devotion to the, the golden age of Hollywood, that of his, his childhood. And the novel, it really lets him explore what that era was like for two of its two of its its most renowned and amazing figures in Wells and Hayworth. And Big Red takes us through the the marriage, the the movies, the manipulations, the uh the uh the the, the, the muck, uh to, to keep the alliteration going. Um and he's got this ingeniously created narrator who gives us a, a ringside seat to the well to the faults and the genius of, of Orson Wells. But through really amazing prose, Jerome also gets across the uh, the allure and the the fragility and the the glamour of Rita Hayworth that all all that all comes together in a particular movie. Um, and he, he has these wonderful, as I call them during the conversation, excursions into a couple of of the films themselves. Um, beyond that, I'll say the the narrator, uh, Rusty Redburn, she she brings us not just into Hollywood, but but into the America of the 40s and 50s. And that's right down to the, the, the awful side of the, the Japanese internment camps during World War II. Um, this is a, a big novel that's only around, well, it's under 300 pages, but it, it captures something big about, a, about this country and the times we were in. And, um, well, it's weird. In a sense, Wells should be the easier of the two figures uh, for for Jerome to, to bring across to the reader because of the the vividness of his his creations, the Citizen Kane and the other great movies and great acting roles, uh, as well as the theater he put on and, and other other artistic creations, but but he manages to bring Rita across as a person in full throughout the course of the book, and not just as a a cipher or a, a balance to, to Wells or the, the the suffering wife or something. I mean he he paints these really gorgeous portraits of these people and the, the world in which they traveled, but he brings a humanity to them. Um, that's too easy to overlook when we're, we're talking about people who were sort of the biggest celebrities in the world once upon a time. And his love for, for both of them really comes through on the page. Um, not that it stops him from conveying the ugliness of their lives and, and how they treated each other and, and other people in the world. But, um, now, like I say, they're, they're people in full. They're artists, and each has their own form of genius. Um, I'll just say Big Red is the sort of book where you can tell the author is is evoking his own childhood and, and his the, the magic that he experienced at the movies when things really were magic. And he takes us behind the curtain where we could see Wells' undoing and Rita's collapse, and we know these things are going to come. But he brings us still deeper into those figures and the notion of, of what celebrity meant and how Hollywood used and got used by it. Big Red's really a, a remarkable piece of writing, and I'm glad Jerome was up for a third go-round on the podcast to talk about, well, to talk about it and his love of Hollywood, his history with the movies, and um, 
As he notes during our conversation, he kind of veered away. We kind of, okay, I kind of veered away from the book itself. The conversation took us in that direction. Um, but it's it's of a piece with the the magnetism that Wells has. And what I think Jerome's real mission is through a number of his books, and that is how one approaches genius. And as a side question, how genius can leave the scene. Because our conversation moves from, from Wells to Melville and Robert Caro and Emily Dickinson and Shakespeare and even um, even Joaquin Phoenix and LeBron James. And I think all of those figures leave us with a, a conversation that's, that's centering on what it means to be possessed by genius. And... Speaking of genius, I should point out Big Red also features an absolutely wonderful cover illustration by a past guest of the show, Ed Sorrell, who I, I consider a genius. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm prattling on too long. It's probably the painkillers talking at this point. Anyway, I was awfully glad to get to sit down with Jerome in person again. Uh, we had to record our second podcast uh, about his novel, Sergeant Salinger, another genius for whom genius is very problematic. We had to record that one remotely, so I'm glad we got to get together in person this time. I'm also glad I finally got to meet his wife, Lenore, who sat in on our talk, too. Now, as caveats go, the um, the moment when I was implying that Herman Melville should be the subject for Jerome's next book, that was the same moment that his cat just came walking right into our conversation, and Jerome thought, I was referring to the cat as a subject of the novel. So rather than go back and correct him, I, I just let it go. Um, so don't think he was deflecting or that uh, there, there's anything weird going on. I'm talking Melville. He's talking the cat. That's where it all went. And here's Jerome's bio from the book. Jerome Charon is the award-winning author of more than 50 works, including The Perilous Adventures of the Cowboy Kid and The Secret Life of Emily Dickinson. A renowned scholar of 20th century Hollywood, he lives in Manhattan. His new book is Big Red, a novel starring Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles. And now, the 2022 Virtual Memories Conversation with Jerome Charon. Tell me, where'd Big Red begin for you? And how long did it, it gestate? Well, I originally, um, I really admire Orson Welles. I think he is, you know, if you think of cinema, he's the genius of cinema. He's the Michelangelo of cinema. And, uh, he had to do it in Hollywood because if he had done, you know, he did all these Shakespeare films and he didn't have the technical facility to make them so um, but Citizen Kane is a film that you can just see over and over again every shot every instant um, has its own poetry you know there's no other film like it and I wanted to write you know I've been teaching cinema for a long time and I did courses on Orson Welles and we watched every film and I wanted to do um, a novel on Orson Welles, so I read all these biographies, and he was unbearable because anything he said was a lie. He would exaggerate and exaggerate beyond exaggeration as far as... And the thing that hurt me the most is what he said about Rita, because she said that the only person she ever loved was Orson, Orson Welles, and... If um, and then in an interview he said, and this was the title of, of a biography um, about her. Um, if you call this happiness, uh, what was the rest of her life like? And in other words, he really disparaged her in a way that deeply disturbed me. You know, and I felt I couldn't. I could do it in the third person, but. I couldn't do a novel in his voice. I wouldn't feel comfortable. You could, you know, do a novel about lies and exaggerations, but after a while, um, it wouldn't work. And I couldn't do it in Rita's voice 
And then when I discovered that she had been violated by her father, you know, she was dancing with him at the age of 12, and, you know, he used her as a kind of sexual pawn, um, it really disturbed me. Then you had the key to her whole life. I mean, she never spoke. She was incredibly shy. Um, but she was profoundly sexual, you know, every move she made. And that's why Gilder is such a revelation. You suddenly see this woman on the screen and she's a kind of tornado. We'd never seen anyone like it. You know, Marilyn had a kind of sexual quality, but she was a comedian mm -hmm. and Rita wasn't. She did it out of silence and movement. So I couldn't do the novel in her voice, so I had to invent a character. And then I said, I really want to do it as, I want a lesbian. I want someone who uh, gets involved with reader in some way, a woman who's, you know, drawn to her. So I invented this character, Rusty Redburn, Rusty for, her, you know, red hair. And Redburn is the name of a Melville novel. I always sort of have a reference to Melville and everything I write, since I, I admire him so much. So once I had the first sentence, and I, I have a very bad memory, but um, I was a, I was an actor who couldn't act, a, a dancer who couldn't dance, a singer who couldn't sing, whatever form it took. Yeah. Once I had that sentence, um, in, in other words, once you have the voice, you have the novel. I know it's very peculiar to say because people will talk about plot, they'll talk about this, they'll talk about that, and I'll talk about voice. Yeah. Once you discover the voice, the 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 you know the rhythm and the movement will come with that voice. And if you don't have it, you don't have a novel. You know the static takes over. So once I had that sentence, I felt at ease. I felt I could take my time, and I love the fact that she became a spy for uh, for for, uh, for, for Columbia, you yeah. know, for Roth, I mean, for, for Cohen. Um, and, um, and then the novel took its shape. Of course, it's always hard to write, because uh, you're dealing with history, and you have to stick to the history, and and my great discovery in the novel was Viola Lawrence, who was a film editor, and I had, had not known about her, and she was the first female film or cutter, cutter, I mean, because you didn't call them an editor at the time. And so using her as a character uh, was important to me, but it was basically a song, a love song to Orson, even though we see him with all his faults and a kind of, uh, you know, homage to Rita at the same time through Rusty's voice, you know. What is a novel? A novel is a narrative. It's a narrative song, you know. If you go back to Homer and the Odyssey, what is the Odyssey? People will say the Odyssey was the first novel. Well, it wasn't originally in written form. It was sung, you know. So I'm a singer in words, you know, I'm singing, but you don't hear me. A singer who can't sing. Yeah. <laughs> singer who can't sing is perfect. You know. How did your, your understanding or appreciation of both Wells and, and Rita change over the course of the book? Or, or were they pretty reified once the novel itself began taking shape? Well, I didn't know as much about Rita. I knew everything about Orson, you know. So Rita was the revelation when I discovered that she'd been sexually abused. I had the key to her personality, her incredible shyness. She was the shyest person in the world. And uh, uh, so I, I, I understood what she was like. And I, I didn't want to get into the Alzheimer's, so I, I ended the, the, the novel in, in 1958 when she's still, you know, uh, performing, but she's beginning to forget her lines because she had early onset Alzheimer's. And of course, I could have dealt with that. I could have had a novel about her loss of memory, but I, I didn't. I didn't really want to do that. That wasn't, you know, we know the story, so why tell what we already know? Yeah. 
Yeah. And what challenge did you find then in terms of creating a fictional framework with you know historical fact? I, I think about the other, we'll say, biographical novels right. you've done. This is, I'd say, the most recent in time with people whose lives are very documented. Compared to like Lincoln, Dickinson, well, well, you know, you, Salinger. You have to remember yeah. that there's another key factor, and that's Hollywood. Yeah, that there's, there's documentation and imagination. Hollywood was right. my home, yeah. so yeah. that yeah. when I first went, because I, I've done a, 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 a nonfiction book on Hollywood, you know, movie land. When I first went out there, I think it was the first time I was out there, and I stayed at the Roosevelt Hotel, and I walked down Hollywood Boulevard, and past Musso's and then went to Hollywood and Vine, saw this mural of all the actors. I was at home. This was where I was born. I mean, in, in other words, uh, remember, it wasn't only cinema, because on the radio you had a program called Lux Presents Hollywood. So even as a kid of four or five, I was not seeing the films, but hearing the films. Yeah. And that's very important. So both radio and cinema come together in a strange way. There was Howard Duff who played Sam Spade. So I watched, I listened, it's interesting, I say watch. I listened to radio every night, religiously. You know, I had my own little radio set. Uh, one of my uncles built a shelf on the wall. And um, my brother came home late, so... And I would buy these pretzel sticks at the 5 and 10. And uh, that was my comfort. That was my joy. Because I had a terrible family. I had a terrible relationship with my father. I mean, he really hated me. And you could see his anger in his eyes. So I needed to, to move inward. And radio, really. So even before going to the movies... The radio gave me a kind of imagination because when you listen to something, you're also seeing something, yeah. you know. So uh, with the radio and then going to the movies at a very early age and going religiously, I was, you know, it's almost a kind of church-like. Uh, the, the cinema house was my church, yeah. you know. I would go there with a kind of religion and I would go there every week and sometimes twice a week. So I literally, from the age of 5 to 13 or 14, I probably saw almost every film that was made. And and even at that point, I, I knew which films were unusual. You know, we didn't have the name Film Noir at that point, right. but I saw certain films that were, you know, particularly in 1947, the key for me was I was watching a film called The Tea Men, and there was a shot of the blinds, and you could see the shadows on the wall, and you never, I'd never seen those kind of shadows before in a film. Of course, you could say it's cinematography, but, you know, um, we, America, um, uh, Hollywood, really, its great discovery is film noir. I mean, this is what we were great at. Yeah. Um, so, and I didn't know I was seeing these film noir. So, um, that, that was my home. The, the movie house, I, I wrote in an article, wasn't, I wasn't born in the movie house, but it was my cradle. Mm -hmm. And also the radio, as I say, was very important. And your, your movement in, in teaching film criticism for, for decades, when did you find you were developing a, an aesthetic voice, I guess. So when did you develop an aesthetics of cinema? I mean, this stuff, as you mentioned with the T-Men, well, you're uh, intuiting it, but yeah, when did it start to become articulate? But, you know, when I, when I applied for a job at the American University, I was living in Paris. First of all, I was told I could never get a job. But the dean happened to have read Movie Land, and I said, I can teach this, this, that, and I put movies at the bottom. And he said, no, I want you to teach film. So I started my own film department. And the only thing I did was, I mean, you had a book to read some kind of nonsense about film history, but I don't think you get very much out of books in terms of films. Um, we would put the film on the screen, and I, I, I said to the students, do not say anything that does not exist within the frame. Yeah. 
You can say, speak about anything, but it has to be within the frame. So what I would do is that we would watch a film together, all together, so we're all seeing them at the same time, the same place, and then talk about them. And I tried to get them to talk as much as possible. So I would give them assignments to, you know, speak about a particular film, and I would be in, in the audience with the other students, and we would have a, a give and take. And it really worked. I, I remember leaving every single class and feeling great. I really had a tremendous sense of pleasure. I watched films I wanted to watch, and I talked about films I wanted to talk, and I never judged the students, so they always had a good time. I was, you know, I was faulted by other departments because I gave grades that were too high. <laughs> So yeah. we had terrible fights because the English department wanted to take over the film department. Yeah. But um, I said, fuck you. you know? Everything's territorial pissing. You know, it's all. And, you know. and also the communications department. But I, I didn't want that. I wanted, uh, I didn't feel it was communications and I didn't feel it was English. It, it, it had its own language. It needed its own voice. It needed its own department. And so I created it. I became the chairman, and uh, we had our own director. But um, he screwed up. Uh, he did. I don't know. He got involved with one of the students, and that killed us. You know, we lost. We we were we were the most popular department in the whole school because we had students making films, and then we lost that. But that that's okay. I'm basically not a a teacher. I just. Um, love watching films and I can watch a film again and again and always see it in a new way you know so this is what I wanted to present first of all my image of Hollywood and if you if you notice uh, when you read the book there is a very visual presentation of Hollywood Boulevard I mean it does exist mm -hmm. in a visceral way and I think without that the, the book wouldn't work Okay, because it, it comes magic, be kind of unless there's something real behind it. Biography yeah. about uh, something in the past. So I brought it back into the present. I'm a kid in Hollywood, okay, watching these films and taking you back into that world. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned at the beginning, discussing the uh, uh, the program, you yeah. said, you know, you don't get much out of books when it right. comes to film. You have a number of passages in, in the book where it's an excursus of several of Wells's films or, yeah. or Rita's films. Um, particularly, you get the third man, Glenda, right. and, and Lady from Shanghai. The narrator goes into you know yeah. what, what's there, and and uh, well, it doesn't jar from the the regular narrative. But how how was it for you, sort of integrating? That yeah, aesthetic but, but remember, into... Remember, Rusty yeah. is yeah. very much involved with films. Rusty right. is me. You know, yeah. she happens to be a woman, but, you know, basically, you know, she's a, a film lover. She has her own movie house, and she's Regina X. She's the commentator <laughs> on, on the films. And um, I think it, it was my editor and, and his assistant editor who seemed insistent on retelling the stories of the films and I I, I didn't necessarily want to do that mm -hmm. the, and, and they kept on going back to the mirror scene and wanting more and more about it and uh, I wanted to to keep the magic of, of, of something in cinema that had never been done before and never been done again where you see the screen shattering I mean, the only other scene comparable to it is the shower scene in Psycho, where you see, you know, the, the lunging of the knife. But it, even though it's more dramatic, it's not finally as influential to other filmmakers as, as the mirror scene, because yeah. the mirror scene shows that the screen isn't integral. It's made up of parts that, you know, that can yeah. smash. And um, I, I think what Wells was able to do in cinema, um, 
and it, it, it's really been proved, proven because what is the filmmaker they write about? They don't write about Scorsese. They don't write about Kubrick. They write about Wells. There's this endless fascination with Wells. And I think just three years, in the last three years, have been three long oh, yeah, Simon Callow has still got yeah. his, his series Simon of, of Wells. Simon Callow is, yeah. is wonderful. On, uh, it's one of the, you know, uh, here's someone who is both an actor and, uh, and a writer writing about Wells. Uh, there are things that I don't agree with, but... He, but arguing's he, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It gets you to articulate your own, or stake out your own position, certainly. Yeah, I, I don't agree with him and his, his understanding of Wells as Shakespearean films. I don't think uh, they, they didn't have... Um, he needed Hollywood as much as Hollywood needed him, and no one, when he had the technical facility like, like he did in, you know, a Touch of Evil, I mean, I think that's his greatest performance um, as Hank Quinlan, I mean, with this crazy putty-looking face, I mean. You show a lot of affection for that in the, the book. Yeah. I, I was hoping it would get to Touch of Evil as I was reading along. It's like, oh, good, he's... he's yeah, yeah, I... I, I uh, that's his great performance where he could um, sort of extend himself in a way that doesn't necessarily work in the Shakespearean films. But it, it is the most Shakespearean of all his films, and it's not Without Shakespeare. being Shakespeare, yeah. Without, <laughs> Without explicitly being Shakespeare, yeah. 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 In a sense, it, it puts me in mind of that, that same question about framing fiction within history that, you know, maybe Wells could do that when there was constraints on him, when it wasn't the limitlessness yes, of I Shakespeare. Yes, I think he needed the, I mean, he had one I, I I argue with everyone but I say that in terms of Hollywood, the two great masters are, the, the two people who change cinema the most are Wells and Tarantino. Mm -hmm. So every film after Pulp Fiction is in some sense influenced by, by that film. Yeah. And with, I was in my with, 20s in the 90s and yeah. seeing how everything, I mean, especially everybody directly aping Tarantino, but then yeah. seeing how it more and subtly... not doing it anywhere as well, no, but, no. but trying to do it. Yeah. Now, with Citizen Kane, it's a little bit different because it comes out as a film and then disappears. It's rediscovered by the French and then we go... We only start seeing it in the 1950s when, you know, we had video shops in, in the 60s. So uh, his influence wasn't felt immediately, but the, the whole idea of the film... I mean, remember, cinema was not taken seriously as an art form. You had the novel, you had, the, you had composers, you had, but, but not film directors. And, and people will say, well, you know... Uh, look Look at the film Joker, okay? Now, it's a very ordinary director. Who is the director of the film? It's Joaquin Phoenix. It's his performance. So films are very bizarre. You take an ordinary director and you take a DC Comics character like the Joker and you turn it into great art. Who would have believed it? But he was able to do it. He's in every frame, every scene. And when I walked out of that film, I said, my God, I've never seen anything like this where the actor is the actual director. There's only one other point that's, you know, Olivier's Hamlet, but of course he is a director. Yeah. But his performance is more powerful than his direction. Yeah. So uh, in Joker, I was just overwhelmed. I'd never seen a film where except one other film that's Brando in, in, um, on the waterfront where he should have been a cliche, he's a boxer, he's, he's uh, you know, he's broken down, but somehow his genius takes him out of the cliche and gives you a performance that's utterly heartbreaking. You really almost have to cry when you see him on the screen. And with Joker... Uh, York and Phoenix, you know, it probably is crazy. Uh, you see something that you've never seen before. And I know there's going to be Joker too, but I, you know, I, I'm speaking with, with a former, you know, student of mine who's become a friend. And I said, 
Yeah, they'll make Joker 2, and it may even be as good, but it's never going to be as good as the first time when around. you're capturing lightning. If you yeah. do it again, what is? who cares? There's no way you can make Joker 2 and have it become a revelation. Mm-hmm. We've already seen it, you know. So that's the thing mm-hmm. about Citizen Kane. We've never seen a film like that where every single shot is a masterpiece. You can just open, and that's what I did with the students. I said, okay, you pick any moment in that film and let's analyze it. And we'll see that there's something in the foreground. The most famous one is the pill bottle in the foreground. And then you see the middle ground. And you see, you see three different things going on at the same time. In other other words, there's a kind of brilliance at every moment, at every level. And it's not simply that he did it in cinema. He did it in radio, and he did it in the theater. He took everything that he did and recreated it. Of course, he was his own worst enemy. That's what I was going to ask, that sense of self-destruction. Yeah. Why did he go to South America and allow someone else to cut the Magnificent Amazons? And why didn't he act in the film? He made two grave errors. He should have acted in the film and should have, you know, been there when it was cut. And it would have been every bit as good as Citizen Kane. He would have been able to do that because it was the story of his life. He grew up, you know, in a small town and he came from a wealthy background. And uh, uh, it would have been... Well, I don't know, would have been, you know, you can't say would yeah, have there's been always because the, it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. nowhere. It's a fucking boring film yeah. because his presence is only sort of half in the film and half out of the film. And he doesn't cut it himself. You know, basically, he is the cutter of his own film. Robert Wise, you know, may have been the official, you know, uh, uh, cutter of the film, but, but it's really Wells. It's Wells's eye. He had the eye of a cutter, of an editor. And uh, that's why uh, even in in, uh, Touch of Evil, I mean, there is a a movement, uh, sort of uh, a lyricism that you don't see in any other filmmaker. And people can talk about Scorsese, and I love Scorsese. And I, you know, and I think The Taxi Driver is is a great film, et cetera, et cetera. But he's not Wells. No one is Wells. And, and and you argue in the book at, at times that Wells wasn't Wells either, that there's... Most often Wells wasn't Wells. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, yeah. we meet him after Citizen Kane. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think when you talk about the, we'll say the, the allure or the, the reason why he's so written about, in addition to the accomplishments, it's it's the accomplishments at 25. You have to do all that but it's not only, essentially it's not, as a it's kid. Not only, it's not only that, Gil. He's just fascinating. I mean, he's such a fucking liar. You know, he just he just distorts everything. He just reinvents and, you know, he goes on television shows with his cigar and... Makes and pronouncements. Makes, and, and, yeah, <laughs> and, and his last film is so bad, it's so awful. Uh, that, you know, we forget. And, and even, you know, when he did The Trial, no, The Trial should have been a great film. Here you have Wells. He has the technical facility. Why is The Trial such a shitty film? I can't give you an answer, you know, because his persona wasn't in that film. He's not Kafka. Okay. So he's not going to give you... I mean... How do you get Kafka onto the screen? Yeah. Soderbergh did his weird uh, attempt okay. at what Soderberg, you have to do to, to be. Soderbergh you know. would be a better choice to yeah. doing Kafka, but no, here he had all the technical facilities. Yeah. He had, you know. But he's a man in defeat. I mean, at that point, he's already been defeated in certain ways or ground down, I guess. I, th- I think you're, ab- you're, you're, you're absolutely right, but I, I, I think he wasn't able to find the key Certainly. to Kafka. He wasn't able to find the key, whereas in Citizen Kane, you know, Kane is really, they say it's Hearst. It wasn't Hearst, it was himself. Yeah. He was talking about himself, and he used Hearst as a kind of mask for his own persona. So the thing is, genius is is really something that comes and goes, and we don't know why it's there. 
How was Melville able to write Moby Dick? He was 30 years old. He wrote the fucking book in one year. In one year, <laughs> he was able to put this book together that no one else could have done and no one else has ever done again. And then he sort of disappeared, you know. So genius comes and it leaves just as quickly. Is it your favorite novel? I think it's the greatest novel. I wouldn't say, I mean, it's hard to say what my favorite novel is, but it's it's something that overwhelms, you know, that it's it's Shakespearean and he was influenced by by Shakespeare. And I, I think that, you know, Melville again was resurrected. He writes this book. Uh, there's a there's a fire in in the you know where the books are stored. They, they disappear, and he disappears for sixty years. In the twenties, there's a kind of comeback. You know, there's a new world, a new world of criticism, and they rediscover him, and suddenly he's back again, and he's now with us. You know, Bartleby the Scrivener. I mean. Um, it does oh, sound like that's the source of another novel for you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've written about this cat, you yeah. know, this uh, <laughs> this cat who can bite you as, as much as give you a kiss. Well, she's been very affectionate, or he. Yeah. Since, like, she, it's a she. So one thing to, that I, I pondered reading the book, given the, we'll say, tension slash adversarial nature between artist and editor, in yeah. this case with, with Vi, how did your own editors respond to that? You know, was there any tension on their side with, hey, you're, you're kind of, you know, being a little harsh on the, the editors on this because we're very important to making an artwork work. But was there any there, sense? There's always tension yeah. because, uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's another voice looking at what you've done and saying, give me more, give me more, more, more. I want more. And it's very hard for me to do that, but I, I think um, I have a wonderful, wonderful editor and, and his assistant editor um, that were very important. I mean, she, she, she was a lesbian. She looked at the... She's a lesbian. She looked at the... Uh, at, the way you characterize Rusty. And, and, yeah. and tried to, you know, tell me where I might have been wrong or right, because remember, man writing in a woman's voice is forbidden you know but uh, I, I didn't care it, it was one of my questions whether you, you know, whether that was a uh, consideration or attention uh in in I casting the, I the narrative i didn't give a fuck i was going to do it that way and i yeah. knew that the narrator had to be a lesbian and i didn't uh, i mean look to give her that inter role to be able to to relate to rita but to also you know have a a to have more of a role, I guess, than a... a well, I, I had envisioned her in a slightly different way, in a more sexual way, and um, I wasn't able to do it. So, in other words, there were certain restraints, and maybe those restraints are, are correct, you know. In, in other words, I do have an extraordinary editor in that he's one of the last editors left who really has a dialogue with you in relation to the text, Editors take a book or they don't take a book, and then they try to sell it. Now he gets involved, so and this is Bob Wilde. Yeah, Bob yeah, Wilde. Yeah. We recorded was, a few years ago, and he was yeah. one of my favorite guests. Yeah, ever, so. and he will jokingly say that he's the real author of the book. Well, in some sense, <laughs> he might be. I he, don't he know. He did say that about one of my favorite yeah. books, also yeah. not not one of yours, but somebody else. Yeah, he, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he's a great, great. There's no look. I, you know, you, you can hate him, you can love him, but, you know, he's a force. He's a force to be, he's a, he's a dynamo. There's no one else, you know, when, when everyone else there has a job and they go home, you know, it's nine to five. He's there 24 the hours a day, you know. Doesn't mean that he always wins, but he's totally there. He's totally there. There's no one else uh, who has that same kind of crazed devotion yes. it does seem well you uh, I, I mean i'm not part of this world but you know i my affection for an earlier time you know the the world before this where people actually uh, like you know caro and gottlieb working together for decades and decades and 
the fact that we know we're never going to see that sort of relationship in publishing ever again. That there won't be. Oh, we might with someone like Caro, you know, uh, you know. Um, um, I just mean the idea that some publishers would well, commit Gottlieb, to a project. Gottlieb was 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 yeah. was was a great editor. Um, but just that sense of of multi decade, you know, relationships yeah, but it's and also, commitments. But, yeah. but you know, it, it's not it's not simply Bob Gottlieb. It, it's 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 Robert Caro. I mean. Uh, I haven't read the Johnson book, so I, I I've can't started speak the first it. one, but I'm waiting until he's finished. Yeah, I decided I, I'm not I'm not jumping into this until yeah, I know book five is out. But certainly his book on Moses is is the greatest book about New York City ever. I written. believe as you were talking about how Melville is Shakespeare, yeah. I believe the power broker is nonfiction Shakespeare for America. Yeah, it, it I is, would I would agree with you. I, I would. It's, it's a totality of power and, and, and politics. And, and yeah. when he, he writes about a neighbor, you know, he's writing about neighborhoods that I know that you yeah. know that were destroyed by the Cross Bronx Expressway, and I, and I visited those neighborhoods, and he writes about them with such detail and such devotion, and he hates Moses, but on the other hand. He makes him Shakespearean. He presents know? him in full. He presents yeah. the fullness of a, a and, man who and, changed and the, the, the city. And the craziest thing that he's yeah. doing these projects, he's building these housing projects for poor people, and one, one of the, the people working there said, Mr. Moses, you don't have any toilet seats. And he said, ah, they can shit while they're standing up. Yeah. You know. So I mean, in other <laughs> words, the prejudice is so great and yet, he, what what's fascinating about him is he wasn't interested in money. That was the thing. He doesn't never enriches himself. No, but it's all about power. And but he did I, have money with the, the Tribal Bridge Authority. Yeah, they had he had own. access to money to get so, what he wanted, and, but it and wasn't personal. You know personal. how he was brought down. Yeah. I don't know if you remember because it was it happened on my block. Yeah, he wanted to take a playground on Sixty Seventh Street and destroy it. You know, because he wanted to build a, a road through the park. And this is West 67th Street, where very, very prominent right. people live. So the wives of the children said to their husbands, who were these, you know, killer lawyers, you know, we can't take our kids to the park. So what did they do? The lawyers went to Governor Rockefeller and said, hey, you know, if you do this, Finally gone too we're going to sue the city. <laughs> You're going to, the city, New York State is going to be broke. So what, is, what does Rockefeller do? He fires Moses. Yeah. Fires him. Doesn't warn him. He fires him. That's it. That's the end. And it's these mothers who brought him down. I mean, it's an incredible tale. Yeah. Again, I believe it's the closest thing to Shakespeare we have in terms totally, of history in America. I totally yeah. agree with you. Until I, I read I, the Lyndon Johnson books and then it becomes, you know, yeah, we'll see if read, I change my I opinion. I read at that the point. Lyndon Johnson books because Lyndon Johnson is a very, very strange character. I mean, we see him in terms of, of, the, of the, you know, Vietnam War. But we have Medicare because of him. We have the civil rights because of him. What if we, you know, I am only alive today because of Medicare. Yeah. You know, I have these operations, these things that they put things in you and the bills come $175,000 <laughs> and, zero, and, zero, zero. and and <laughs> Medicare pays $15 or whatever it is. <laughs> I don't know. But the thing is, I would never be able to have these procedures. Uh, and, uh, you know, Medicare and, and when the Republicans say they're going to defund Medicare, they are fucking themselves because oh, I, I tell you, 2017, uh, I, I in my day job where I'm a lobbyist right. for the, the weird part of the pharmaceutical industry. Right. I met with some Republican staff about uh, the bill that we worked on, which was this FDA reauthorization. Right. But they were in the middle of the whole repeal and replace thing for yeah. affordable care. And 
I explained to one of these staffers after, I'm like, I don't think you guys understand what you're really trying to do here because you're going to turn this entire country into serfs. We're all going to be, you know, afraid to ever quit our jobs or launch a business because, oh, it's you not, know, we're afraid it's we'll not, never get coverage. Not gonna, well, I and hope, the, the, he just, I hope you know, it's not going to work. Oh, no, they, they were aghast. And then McCain ended up sinking them, um, yeah. you know. Well, that, that but spring. look, we had yeah. to depend on one. I know. It one was guy who wasn't utterly dependable. And was half dead. So that was the thing, the the brain tumor thing. When you realize afterwards, like maybe that was causing part of the the reason. But I think he just wanted to no, screw Trump he over. Was, and, he <laughs> was a strange. McCain was a strange man. I, yeah. I, I think the Republican Party itself, um, sort of, I don't know, went in the direction that you know it's the fear of black people or whatever. I I, I don't know what what it is. But once they realized they couldn't win the votes legally, you know, what they should have done is fight for an electorate where they could win. Yeah. And you change your policy that, or you, or you yeah, eliminate you know, they, portions they, of the, look, uh, the voters. They had the white vote, you know, in, in every single election, no Democrat has ever had in the last, fit before, uh, I think it, Roosevelt was the last one, who had the majority of white white males. After that, I think Obama had 37% of white males. When you think about that, that's incredible. And he still was able to win. Right. Build coalitions. Win, you know. But yeah, it's um, seeing, well, again, seeing how power works in both, you know, a Robert Caro uh, yeah. dimension and then seeing it in real life, as I've had to do with, with Washington. Right. Um, you realize Shakespeare knew an awful lot, even when there wasn't, you know, democracy and elected systems. He knew an awful lot about how people behave around yeah, power. I, I, it, it's you know. really unfathomable that, that that we have Shakespeare, because if you go back to that time, you know, first of all, his use of language. Where did it come from? I don't you know, there are just two writers. There's Emily Dickinson and Shakespeare. And I just don't understand where their sense of language came from. I'm just, and it's not only Emily Dickinson's poems. Her letters are just as great. Yeah. You know, no one talks about them. They're the greatest letters ever written. And uh, when you look at Shakespeare's plays, I always, I mean, I think all of my comedic writing came out of the, sort of give and take between Lear and the fool. Yeah. You know, there's nothing like, and when the fool says, nothing comes from nothing, I mean, I mean, you can't say anything better than that. Yeah. You know, the thing is the... But to wed that use of language with yeah. that understanding of human behavior and, yeah, and, that, that, and the magnificence that, of, in, of in, people. At that time, that he should have such a modern consciousness that he should understand he's more modern than modern. In, in other words, he just understood human nature. And then, and then what is most astounding is that he's just stopped writing pay, plays and retired as if it were, it were his, his day job right. that he quit, you know. <laughs> Punch so, the clock and, and, and then done just now. retires and doesn't write. And I'm just saying, how did that happen? So he was an actor who became a playwright, and he made a certain amount of money when he had enough money. Uh, then he went back and and and, and uh, lived. I think he lived to fifty-four. He retired at fifty, but and I think he wrote Hamlet at the age of thirty. Imagine someone at the age of well, yeah. Melville wrote Moby Dick at the age of thirty. I just can't fathom. Moby Dick or Hamlet is is the work that I go back to each time because uh, I just don't understand how any human being could have had that kind of melody. You know, this is what I've been seeking all my life and will never, never have. But does that mean that you're not going to try to have it, that you're not going to, you know, keep going and hoping, you know, that you will come as close as you can. I think people forget that novels are stories, 
And stories have to move. They have to have an energy. They have to have a lyricism. They have to have a lyrical power. And sometimes the language on the page stops the action, and you don't really want that to happen. You need to push forward. The energy has to always move. The propulsion has to always be forward. A big red took two sittings for me total. The the, the prose is just who pro- you're insulting. Me. Well, I read the first thirty pages in one night, and then the rest of it the next day because no, it just, just it just propels you I'm though. Just it, but but it's a question I have when you bring up those works of genius at thirty. Are there books? Well, could you have written your younger books in your later days? And are there things you're writing now that you could not have written when you were younger? No, I could not have written this book yeah. when I was younger, and also. Um, the thing is that, you know, I had no education. I had no, uh, nothing at home. There were no books at home. Um, so the only thing I had was my imagination. And so I had to really learn the music. I mean, I think the first author that really propelled me in terms of music was Joyce because he had... Uh, uh, a faultless ear. You know, you look at any sentence in Joyce and it's totally musical. But when you go back and you look at Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, um, they're dated in some way because they don't deal with the total evil in the world. The world has changed yeah. so much from the time that... Uh, Joyce wrote uh, Ulysses. We, 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 the human being has become monstrous. And, you know, Trump is just a manifestation. He's just a, a, a Trump yeah. of a Trump. You know, but it's it, even those, those interwar books, when you, you see know, the, the horror that World War I rent, yeah. and you see these genius writers trying to deal with it, not knowing what's coming a quarter century down the pike. And yet you have, out of World War I, you have, and because Hemingway was a correspondent, you know, Hemingway is very bizarre because while he was in Paris, he was the greatest writer in the world. Once he left Paris, he was the worst writer in the world. <laughs> so it's interesting. Yeah. What, what was it? What was it that happened? Was it fame? Was it, uh, you know, he didn't understand women. There's, there's only one story in all of his work, and that's the, what is it, the short, happy life of Francis, I don't know. Uh, Macomber, Macomber, I think. Macomber, yeah, 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 where the woman is, is more powerful than the man and, and kills, kills the husband. You have an understanding of what, otherwise, they're, they're dolls. I mean, I mean, you look at... Uh, uh, for whom the bell tolls, and, and you have this fake Spanish language. I love thee, thee, you know, the, the, the attempt to get Spanish into English. I mean, he's a fool. He's a, he, be, he became a fool, you know, Papa Hemingway, you know, and uh, I did a play about him. Of course, I've never, you know, shown it to anyone, but I have a play where, where uh, Hemingway is in the madhouse, and Mary, it's called Mary and Hem, and she comes to visit him, and they perform in the madhouse, you know. Um, but uh, he was a tremendous influence because he had something that no other writer had, and that is the real language is not in the sentences, but it's in the space between each sentence. There's a whole world in the space between every sentence. And no other writer has that particular quality. So he's able to move in a way that uh, we've never seen before and we probably won't see again. Yeah, it puts me in mind of some of the theories of how comics and comic books work. That yeah. It's the space between the panels. Exactly. That's what the... Exactly. That's where time is, and that's how yeah, we, we. Yeah, you're you know. you're totally right about about that. That the uh, we we are unfair. I call them graphic novels, not yeah, whatever term we, we comic use. Comic yeah, books, and yeah. I love working in that form, of course, because I admire the artist so much. So even though my role is diminished, 
I still love seeing, you know, what I write turned into images, and that. Uh, when you when you write for comics, have they been or graphic novels? Are you scripting by panel, or are you more giving I the artist a story? I originally started scripting by panel, but the artists themselves didn't want it. Because that's so, a yeah. That philosophically, there's different ways of approaching this, yeah, and sometimes they, they you trust the artist to, to. They didn't want me yeah. to describe. Give me the dialogue. Tell me the action, and I'll, I'll no, make it. No, give me on the, the action and as, as a narrative, and I'll do my own panels. Yeah, and I think you have to give the uh, the artist the, the, the privilege of of, uh, of doing it that way if that's the way they want to work. So besides the Hemingway play, do you have other uh, under the, the, the bottom drawer? Oh, works? I have three or four plays <laughs> because you've got like fifty books out, and and I'm wondering whether there's more well, stuff. I, there, I, and, uh, and remember, I was you know at the actor studio, I was a member of the playwright group, and uh, that was an incredible experience. You're working with Kazan, and you could have any actor perform in any in any role. So you. Uh, what did that teach you about writing in terms of... Well, it taught me a yeah. lot about dialogue. Yeah. It taught me a lot. Writing plays taught me a lot about dialogue. And, and the, you know, in, at that point, the actor's studio was a shrine. It was holy ground. I think it was 46th Street in a cellar. And uh, it's too bad that they moved out of there once they lost that place. There was no more active studio. I was just reading, Lenore showed me an article by Simon Callow about the active studio. And, and, and it doesn't, you know, even the memory of it no longer exists. You know, in other words, what, what, it had such a powerful influence and the influence has disappeared. Yeah, we started that series of, uh, uh, uh Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman, that, yeah. that sort of documentary. Terrible. Did you see I only that? did the first episode, and it was like, yeah, we'll get back to this at some point. But yeah. the idea of having everybody, well, having George Clooney read the Newman and, and stuff was a little a little weird. But but yeah, it's, it's... It was a greater story. It was a more complicated story. And I interviewed uh, Newman, I mean, yeah. because he didn't want to be interviewed, but, you know, I, since I was... A, with the studio, he, he, you know, and he's, and it was at a point when he wasn't working. He says, I haven't worked for three years. And what, what did it mean? It meant that he no longer was the same box office attraction that he was. And so if you didn't give him his 20 million, he wasn't going to work. He could have worked. Yeah. You do Don't something for scale for or million. you do. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, and we lost films that, and we've just gone back and, and seen some of uh, Newman's films, and he's uh, he was uh, an extraordinary actor. You know, he took his limitations and he turned them into strengths. And I, and that I, seemed I, to be the thrust of the, the miniseries, only from yeah. the, the first episode, that he understood what he could and couldn't do and, yeah. and accepted it and, and built from there. And also, he was so handsome. He, yeah, it's... It it's a blue, double-edged sword. <laughs> those blue eyes. And it's also the first time I heard him say, I, I'm Jewish, because he never said that before. Yeah. He would deny that. You know, his father was a clothing manufacturer, and he shied away from that. So hearing him say that was a shock. Right. You know. So we haven't gotten together in person since the pandemic began, yeah. but you're getting out to movies no. Okay, you're only watching here? I, I wondered if you've, yeah, you've been we, able we, to, to... We, I did see The Joker. We did go to see The Joker, and we did, and we did see the James Bond, but uh, I don't know. I don't feel I'm, comfortable. I'm not, I, I've avoided... This is the yeah. most people I've been around in, in yeah. two and a half years. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't... Um, there is a, a wonderful theater on 23rd Street, which... If we do go back, because they have spaces between seats and you can get food and yeah. you can get tickets. And uh, maybe when my assistant comes, we'll, we'll go. We'll go to. Uh, but what is there to see? That was my next know, question. I mean, what, if you what, were to go out to the movies, what would you actually. Or, you know, or DC or, you know, or. Or Tom Cruise and, and you know, a bunch well, of Tom planes. Cruise, I don't mind because, you know, I, I, Top Gun 2, I mean, 
you're going to have fun at least. Sure. But uh, it doesn't mean that I would want to go into a movie house to see it. You know, there is I the. Did, I did want to see Joker, and also one of the shots when he's down that staircase when he yeah. goes. That was a staircase that I went down when I lived in the Bronx, so right. I, I knew it. I've yeah. heard, unfortunately, it's become the the Instagram place. Everybody goes yeah. there now and takes their, their pictures. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. it's an incredible staircase because it leads you from one street. And, and the thing is, when I was doing a film about a... Um, I, I don't know what... I was writing a screenplay for... Um, I don't know what they were called, runners, the, the, the guys, the, the newspaper guys who got the, the stories that they gave to the newspaper surveys. or what, what I don't know what it was, but anyway, I was in the Bronx, and I was on the, the bottom of that staircase, and on the top of that staircase, there was a fight between two gangs. And Gil, I cannot explain to you what I saw. In the space of one minute, I saw these fists moving, and then the fight ended. It was like seeing a ballet. I, I never got over that. They just were moving so quickly, and then it stopped. Yeah. You know, it was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen. I have two questions left, because we're, we're coming yeah. up on an hour. Um, we'll go with the first one. Of What have you been reading? I, I you still got your Maria I Callas. Only, uh, I could see yeah, in the background. I, I'm there, doing so. a novel on Maria Callas, so I'm reading Maria Callas. I really don't have time to do anything because, again, I have to walk. You know, I can't play table tennis. So to keep my health, I have to walk. And so um, I don't have time to do anything other than to research yeah. what I'm working on. And the last question then, NBA predictions? Because we talk basketball a lot the first time. Well, right? because, the I don't know. Everything that, is held on Kevin Durant that landing LeBron somewhere. LeBron is not leaving the Lakers means that he's falling into a tub of shit and he will never win another championship. And I just feel that now he's a showman and Hollywood is more important than the game because there's no way the Lakers can win anything. They don't have a team. And he's the reason why I've been watching basketball for such a long time. I just think that, first of all, he's not a great shooter, but he can play any position. I've never seen a play. He can be yeah. the center. He can be the Yeah, it's the one thing to see guard. someone who could defend every position. Yeah. To see someone who could play on offense and be every single he's role. He's a great center. He might yeah. be the greatest center of all time. and But he's not a great shooter, and he'll never be a great shooter. But... You know, his desire to win championships have propelled him from team to team. And I just don't see the Lakers. Uh, the only other team that really interests me now are the Celtics. And they don't interest me in the same way that I love. Le I love LeBron, you know. Did you ever but think... But I hate to see yeah. him lose, you know. In all likelihood, if he stays healthy, he passes Kareem this year for all-time scoring. But Did we, you ever think that was was possible? Not just for LeBron, but, you know. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think the all-time scoring, uh, if, if you think uh, people talk about the greatest player, you know, the GOAT. Yeah. Well, for me, the GOAT is Bill Russell because there's no one who could come. You know, I watched him play. Yeah. And you could not go near the basket when he was under the basket. He was just hitting whatever you, 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 he was like a goalie, you yeah. know, whatever you, you put towards the basket, he just knocked it away. And for him to have 40 rebounds was nothing. And Michael Jordan, when we watched that wonderful oh, documentary, The Last Dance, the oh, last dance so <laughs> it really made me cry. I mean, when his father died, I never understood why he, uh, left basketball to play baseball and I understood he did it for his father but or he because was, he had a gambling problem and David Stern kicked him out of the league for a year and a half but that's just a, a rumor and a, a, a no that's a theory. not true <laughs> I know, no he I did know. it after his father's death he yeah. may have had a gambling problem but he had the money so yeah but he was the greatest shooter of uh, 
uh, I think the great because to see him, it, it's like a ballet when he moves into the air oh. and he can do so many things. We forgot. And until you watch that series again, you realize you remember what that was like seeing him just hang and the, the, the double the clutch, air, the, the light. And, you know, it's like and Nijinsky, the will. You know, yeah. it's like Nureyev. I mean, he was just, but he didn't have a voice. You know, he just wasn't. He wasn't modern. You know, he just was very. He was marketing. I mean, he he. That was the Republicans buy Nikes too. That was know, his thing, and Barkley pushed and you know jordan wanted to make his corporate money and you know well i don't care world. about his corporate money he, he deserves it i mean he, yeah. uh, he, played, he didn't take stands when he could have taken stands he should but, have taken he's taken yeah. stands lately but uh he should have taken them much earlier okay he became the president of a of, of, a, of a club but uh you take he, russell one jordan two as as I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't number them I, I I would say all those three and and Kareem those four to me um, you could have an argument for you know I I could I could I could take either of those four and argue that one of them was the best and I could win every argument and lose every argument. Right. If you said all around playing, it's LeBron. There's just no comparison. If you talk about a player who can defend and prevent you from getting near the basket, then it's just Russell. There's just no one. You know, eleven championships. Come on, there's no one. There's no one that can. But if you talk about the beauty of the of, of the movement, well, that's Jordan. But if you talk about athleticism it's kareem you know so each of them would uh yeah. now if you put them all together in a game i don't i don't know what would happen but it's, of course i think lebron would win because he would never get tired he would go so from I, one I, position to the next when and, he came uh, up I, I said you take Carl, I, you, know, you know the thing is i love lebron i don't care what he does he can stay in la i'm not going to watch his games because it's too sad <laughs> To see him lose, he's, he's just going to be a buffoon on a team of buffoons. So, but the thing is, what has brought me back to basketball was LeBron, and just I don't know. I loved, I loved his uh, his desire. His he was there every minute to win, and he would do anything. Sac you know, he played the most minutes because remember, yeah. here's a guy that should have been injured, you know, yeah. and he has had injuries. Only in the last couple of years, because yeah, I think... But he will have more yeah. and more. Yeah, he's getting to your late 30s. But, you know, yeah. he, he had his best statistics last year in terms of, you know, so it, it's just it's just unbelievable. But I love him. So to see him on a team of clowns uh, and to think that he signed again with the Lakers... I will never understand that. You should have gone. You should have gone to to the Golden I think this is State. Your, this is your next novel after yeah. after Maria Callas, the, the LeBron. You book. should have gone to Golden <laughs> State. That would have been the move that I would yeah. have made. They yeah. would have made room for. Him. You saw how how Durant got. You know. Well, Durant is finished. For doing There's it. no place for him to go, and uh, and no one will pay the price. Yeah. Anyway, you and I could talk about basketball yeah. forever, um, but I want to. Thank you for coming on again. I'm so glad we oh, got together in, per yeah. in person this time. Of course, time. we didn't talk that much about the book, but of course, I'll talk know, in the intro all about Car it. It was Caro, a blast. Caro is so, in, you know, that book is so overwhelming that I, uh, I never got over reading that book. Besides Callus, is there a novel or a person you really want to get to? Um, After her, I mean. Not that you should jinx I, I, yourself. I don't, don't, don't know. You know. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still stuck in, in her world, so it's difficult for me to. I don't know if I would want to do an historical figure again. I'm not. Uh, you know, and I, I just did Callis because we happened to see a documentary, and I fell in love with her. You know, I didn't know. She was so extraordinary, and also her background was not that dissimilar from mine. And I love that she she got into fist fights with both men and women, and she usually won. Yeah. And the you only know? 
non-American figure in your your. She was born and she is American. Okay, she was yeah. born in America. She went yeah. back to Greece at fourteen, but mm -hmm. you know she was born and she was she was born in Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital, but she lived in the in the Greek area of Astoria and then moved to to Manhattan. And at the age of thirteen or fourteen, she went back to Greece. And she never felt comfortable in... Uh, she did come back to New York after Greece for two, three years, but she was not comfortable here. So she was, uh, you know, lived a lot in Italy and then ended up in Paris on a street that I passed. Every time I saw my lawyer, I didn't know that it was the Avenue Georges Mandel was where she had lived, if I had known then. I mean, when we go back to Paris, we'll visit... We'll visit that street. I mean, uh, I guess that'll be my last question then. You going back to Paris? Do you guys have travel plans? I would love to go back to Paris. Yeah, you know, but I don't know if I want to sit on a plane with a mask. You know, it's tough. I'm I'm putting off deciding on a business trip to Frankfurt this this you know, fall because it's seven plus hours and then all that. But it's dangerous, Gil. You I know, know. I'm, I'm you immunocompromised now too. If you can so. avoid it. Avoid it. I'm can. going to go back and hide in the woods. Meanwhile, you sign a copy of the book? Sure. And that was Jerome Charon. His new novel, Big Red, is out now from Live Right Books. And like I said, I, I loved it. It is a wonderful read. A kind of, a kind of black, bleak valentine to Hollywood. And the the intersection or, or car crash, whatever, of art and commerce. So give it a read along with Jerome's other recent books that we talked about over the years, like um, his historical novels about Teddy Roosevelt, uh, J.D. Salinger, Emily Dickinson, uh, his crime novels, including the Isaac Seidel books, uh, as well as the graphic novels he's written, like Little Tulip and the, the Magician's Wife. And you can find out about all of this stuff at Jerome's site, which is jeromecharon.com. It's got links to everything, and that's J-E-R-O-M-E-C-H-A-R-Y-N.com. He's also on Twitter as Jerome Charon, all one word, spelled the same way. I'll put links to all that in the show and episode notes for this one. Now you can support the Virtual Memories show by um, telling other people about it. Just tell them there's this guy out there doing these great podcasts every week with really interesting, creative folks. Um, you can also help the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it, which creative folks you think I should be recording with, uh, what movie or TV show or book or music or piece of theater or art exhibition, whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by postcard. I love postcards, uh, letter, email, um, DM on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, they're both VMS pod or leave a message on my Google voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And um, messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you go longer than that, call back, leave a second message, and let me know if it's cool to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. Sometimes people might have things they'd want the audience to hear, but I would never run one of those without the speaker's permission. So if you leave a message, let me know if it's cool to share on the show. Now, if you have money or other resources to spare... I'd appreciate it, but don't give it to me. I've I've got a good day job. My expenses are pretty minimal, although this episode, going into the city, parking, etc., kind of ran up the, the bills in a way that I haven't had to in a while with all these remote ones. But whatever, I'm, I'm taking care of myself just fine. If you've got money that you can spare, then, you know, help out individuals or institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, TopatoGo, Crowdfunder. There'll be people who are just trying to cover their medical bills or their rent or trying to fund artistic projects. Whatever it is, you might be able to help them uh, you know, make ends meet. And when it comes to institutions in need, I give to my local food bank, Poor People's Campaign. Uh, I make targeted election funds, uh, election contributions. I did one just today with a... Well, with a congressman who works on a 
uh, committee that's very important at my day job. So uh, I kicked in some money so I can attend his reelection uh, event in uh, about a week or so. I will not be doing a podcast there. Um, but you can uh, give to those sorts of sources. You can give to freedom funds, election funds, um, women's choice, abortion funds. There are a lot of things you can do to, to try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 